and on the way back is when there was a car crash and you were in the car yeah i was in the car yeah it was me my uh, my father my grandmother my mum my mum and my brother older brother older brother yeah he was middle one okay yeah so my father my grandmother and my brother passed away <laughs> Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah ama ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And welcome back to Beyond the Mimba podcast I'm your host Muhammad Basaeed And today, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen We have a very, very, very special episode uh, I'm joined here with uh, a guest I've not had on the show before Which is a blessing to have him I'm with Sheikh Aqeel Mahmoud Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh How are you keeping? Alhamdulillah, how are you? I'm good. I finally got you, yeah? That's it, yeah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's, uh, it's a blessing to have you here. It's a blessing to be here. Um, I want to that I wanna tell you what I want to talk about, inshallah, and how I got to um, this topic, right? So when I reached out to you, there was a couple of things I wanted to discuss. Uh, and first, I wanted to discuss your father, right? And then you know, want to discuss you. And people will understand why I want to talk about your father in a minute. So at the masjid... Um, uh, last year we had a uh, a da'wah, st- not a da'wah, sorry, a strategy day, strategy strategy day for the staff members, and in it we discussed the history of Green Lane Masjid, and our Imam Qari Zakaullah he took uh, he took uh, not the stage but he stood in front of us and he started telling us bits and uh, about the history of Green Lane Masjid, in which your father's name was mentioned. So the first question I want to ask, inshallah, for the podcast is. Who was your father? So my father was uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Ahmed Mirpuri. Um, he was from Pakistan. Uh, he lived in a village just outside of Mirpur called uh, Chitarpari. Okay. Um, and he was a student of knowledge. He studied in Pakistan f- in his youth um, as a young boy. And then eventually, uh, by the grace of Allah, he was accepted at the Islamic University of Medina um, in 71, 1971. Um, so it was one of the uh, early batches. Mm-hmm. I think the university opened in the late 60s, I think. Mm. Um, so yeah, he was one of the early batches, alhamdulillah. And yeah, he was there for five years, I believe, four or five years. Uh, he graduated from the faculty of Sharia. Um, so... You know, they say as as the years go by, um, they always, people always say the Jamia isn't as it used to be. <laughs> so, you know, when I was there, people said Jamia isn't as it used to be. <laughs> when I left, people, you know, we would say uh, after we would meet people who who are studying there later on, we yeah. would say, you know, the Jamia is not what it used to be. Yeah. And then people we meet now who graduate, they'll be like, the Jamia is not <laughs> what it used to be. So it's always changing. So you know, back then, you know, obviously the Jamia was like a different, it was a different kind of, it was different beast if you like yeah um so yeah there were like scholars there such as uh Shah Soeb hassan from london he was kind of like a contemporary i think he was there earlier he was the second of her yeah the second uh batch of students who graduated from the islamic university in history yeah so my father was after him but they were i think they were around the same time um i believe uh, alama ihsan lahi zahir was there around the same time um yeah and there were others as well um so yeah he was there and then 75, he uh, had a, um, uh, there was a, a, a tour taking place, or like a, like a visit from some of the scholars uh, mm. who were sent uh, by Saudi Arabia to this country just to see the da'wah potential. Yeah. And uh, Sheikh Al-Bani was one of the people, one of the teachers. Yeah. Because he was teaching at the time in, in, the, in the Jamia. Yeah. And from the students was my father. Oh. And he met uh, Sheikh Asim. Mm. You know, Sheikh Asim is, is yeah. It? So Sheikh he's one of the people who founded yeah Adil's Ad, Adil's grandfather yeah yeah Adil Ustad Adil Salim's yeah, yeah. grandfather so Adil's Adil. grandfather um, so he was already here okay yeah I'm not sure how long he was here for um, but he was the one who basically started Marcus Jamia Al Hadith mm. which was which is the umbrella organization and yeah. you know Green Masjid is like part of that yeah um, so he need he was asking for help he needed help. Uh, my father came with with this um, kind of um, delegation, yeah, delegation, yeah. and uh, they got to know each other. And then a year later, in seventy six, when my father finished, I think he went back home to Pakistan for a while, um, and then he came here. Mm. Uh, and it was Sheikh Mbaz at the time who sent him. 
It was Sheikh Ibn Baz who sent your father. Yeah, he was a mudir at the time. He was oh. he was the principal of the University of Medina at the time. Oh. So he was under his kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, he was he was the principal at the time. So it was his decision. Um, he would make this. He, at, in those days, they would always send students out to yeah. different parts of the world. Yeah, that yeah. was the aim of the Jamia in the first place, to send students to parts of the world where they could give da'wah. Yeah. You know, Sheikh Saib, Sheikh Saib Hassan from London, he, Hafizullah, he went to uh, Kenya initially. He was in Kenya. Yeah, yeah. Subhanallah. You didn't, you didn't know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, he was in Kenya. Ajib. So he went, to, they sent him to Kenya, and I think the situation was, uh, it became very dif- difficult there. Yeah. And so he said, it's just getting too difficult here, so uh, they asked him where he wanted to go, and I think he said England, so they sent him to England. Ajib. Yeah, so my father was, uh, that's how my father came, and uh, Sheikh Asim was uh, the Amir of the Marqas, yeah. and eventually my father became the uh, General Secretary. Um, and yeah, that's 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 what happened. And Great Masjid was always like the headquarters mm, of all of the the the, the, the markets are, are in the UK. Yeah, yeah, the, the and, Hadith and ones. Yeah, and the, the the property I think was bought. I'm not sure. You must know when the property was bought. This, this 1979, I believe. 79, yeah. But I think prior to that, they were collecting funds for it. Yeah. Yeah, and they, it was like twenty four thousand pounds or something they yeah, put yeah. the building for. Yeah, which yeah. is amazing. Like, uh, yes, yeah, compared anything, to now. <laughs> yeah, can't get anything for that much now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, twenty four thousand. Subhanallah. And there was a Kuwaiti uh, scholar. Yeah. Um, His name was something Al Mutawwa. Al Mutawwa. Yeah, Abdul Aziz Al Mutawwa. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he paid like t- he gave twenty thousand pounds for for the for the building. Yeah. At the time, I remember people would say, and you know, I used to always hear this from the elders. They would always say, look, you know, people would tell my father, they would say, why are you buying this building? Mm. Like, we don't need it. Yeah. It's huge. It's, it's a massive property. Yeah. It's, it's really big. And so they would say, you know, it's like a few of us, you're buying this massive building. It's, we don't need it. It's too big. Yeah. And obviously my father had an idea. He had, you know, there was a vision, vision. there. Yeah. You know, Sheikh Asim as well. They all had an idea of what was, you know, what, what the plans were. And they had like a vision for the da'wah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. And it shows us the importance of thinking big. Yeah, definitely. So and having a vision. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to talk to you about that because it was indeed, you know, subhanAllah, they had something else in their mind uh, about what this place would become, you know. And um, wh- obviously now you've told us, uh, Allahumma barik, your, your father, he studied in Pakistan and studied in the Jamia. And then he came to the UK in which he was involved in uh, the project of... Um, of uh, Ahl al-Hadith, the Markaz in Ahl al-Hadith, up and down the country, you know, and creating uh, a network, you know, in which uh, this place was the hub for all of that, mm-hmm. all those places. Now, focusing a bit more, inshallah, about him, because you see, <coughs> I've tried to do my research, right? And you uh, gotta do your research, man. You're the <laughs> you're the host. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've tried to do my research, you know, and, uh, and and I really think we should put together like a proper history of of Green and Masjid, you know. And yeah. there's bits in there that have been written, you know in different places and what i was trying to find out was how old you were at the time right because my question to you was what memories do you have of him uh whether it being back home or here so i was uh, i was born in 84 okay um so i just have very vivid not vivid the opposite very like uh, yeah vague kind of uh, almost picturesque kind of memories, yeah. you know. Mostly at, at home, just a few memories. Yeah. Just at home with my father, with with, with the family. Yeah, yeah. That kind of thing. Nothing. Um, yeah, I was four years old, so there's not much mm. there. It was more like what people would say. say yeah. You know, and, and the kind of uh, effect he had on the da'wah on people, you know. And you'd get a lot of a lot of cases where you'd the people would mention who you are who i was mm. and then people would be you know they'd be happy and they'd come and hug you and you know, yeah. some, one of those kinds of things and then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. subhanallah that just shows who what kind of person my, you know, my father was yeah. um yeah and obviously he was so busy he, he was so committed to the da'wah he was he wasn't really um in the in the house he was traveling a lot you know up and down the country um so that was, you know, that was to the extent where uh, even his 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 eating routine, I think, wasn't wasn't like he didn't have a good eating routine. Hmm. He would just eat whenever he would get the chance. Because mum would my mom would tell me that she would say like he'd have sometimes he'd have stomach problems, hmm. and then the doctor would say it's because you know you need to have a proper routine Team. of when you eat. Hmm. But yeah, I think he would just eat whenever he had a chance. You know, like you know, middle of the night or. Early yeah, morning or in the afternoon, whenever he was able to, he would just eat. And yeah, yeah. So, so he was always busy. He was always busy, like you know, up and down the country doing doing dawah. Subhanallah. 
what uh, going back to we were talking about um the uh, the beginning of Green and Mashid, how what role did he play in in, in starting that? You know, because I know he was one of the the main people. There was him and another person who came with him from Medina uh, to help uh, Sheikh Asim. Yeah, uh, Sheikh Sharif from Sh- London. From Ham London. Sharif, yeah. Yeah. Ham Sharif. Um, yeah. So th- there was a few of them. Um, I think at the time Sheikh Asim wanted help. He needed help. He wasn't, you know, there weren't that many people around at the time, yeah. and uh, he was in need of help. Uh, he needed he needed a base. Mm. To start his uh, to start the da'wah or to just continue the da'wah properly, yeah. and he he also like was looking for people who were learned, yeah. people who had studied the deen, yeah. um, and that's where the university came in, and they were able to like send people like my father, mm. um, and so of course my father was in Medina, he had you know contact with the scholars there, um, and that really I think helped, yeah. especially having like you know uh, colleagues, people who who you studied with, yeah. um, who obviously graduated and they did their own you know initi- they had their own initiatives their own projects they became who they became like Shah Sahib and others yeah. um so it was it was just uh, it was it was really a, a perfect kind of uh, uh choice really yeah you know, he, was, he was in an ideal position yeah, yeah um he was from Pakistan and yeah. obviously the majority of people here were from Pakistan yeah. um and uh, he was well he was well spoken sure. and he had a drive I think he had a drive. You'd, you had, you'd have to have a drive, you know, to do what he did. Yeah. So the fact that he did all that, subhanAllah, it's, um, it's only by, you know, the permission of Allah. Mm-hmm. Allah's, well, that's power and by his strength. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, what he did was, uh, it was obviously, it was down to him, but it was also other people as well. Yeah. You know, it was um, a collective effort. I know you said... Um, you, you know, when you talk about memories, of course, it says you were very young at the time. But from when people see you, of course, they must tell you so much, right? Have you ever took moments where you extracted a lesson or lessons um, from what people have told you about uh, your father? I've caught you off guard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think... Because I know there's probably, like, you get lots of people yeah who, who especially the, from the elders of yeah. the community well subhanallah like there's not that many left now so. in terms of the elders yeah subhanallah so yeah i think one of the things that i always um i always think about is the fact that uh that obviously the jamia played a huge part yeah the jamia played a huge part and so if he wasn't the jamia this wouldn't have happened you know him coming here and you know being sent etc mm-hmm. so yeah but specific kind of um things that people mention with regards to him you know they they, they say he was very persuasive Mashallah. yeah they would say he was very persuasive you know he, if people were like hesitant in terms of like committing to the da'wah or you know he would always remind them you know what are you going to say in front of allah um when you know you was you were in a position to give da'wah you're in a position to help you know, whether it's volunteering or being a teacher at the madrasa, which was obviously in its early stages in those days, or yeah. whatever capacity, you know, he was somebody who it said that he was quite persuasive. You know, he would really like, uh, you know, persuade you and say the right things to, you know, get a person to, you know, to do whatever it was that was needed to, to be done for the yeah. da'wah. Yeah, myself. So people mentioned that. They say he was, you know, persuasive. He would be like, you know, he would na- nail it home. Yeah, and then people would just be like, okay, <laughs> yeah, they, would, they would they would they would do things. Allah so Mubarak. yeah, mashallah. And and Sheikh, you know, um, I I was told by um, Qari Zakaullah Salim, our Imam as well, that he was um, he played a part in bringing Sheikh Hafizullah and Sheikh Abdul Hadi. Yeah, uh, yeah, in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, in the eighties. Yeah. yeah, Sheikh Abdul Hadi, I think, came in eighty six, eighty seven. Mashallah, I think. Yeah, you have to confirm, but I will do. Um, this one, my, my research is lacking. Yeah, because it was the, it was eighty eight. My father passed away, so I think he came a year or two before that. Eighty eight. Yeah, so yeah, so he, yeah, he was the one who brought them. Hmm. And it's interesting because I remember, uh, I'm not sure who it was who mentioned it, but the the last conference that that took place before he passed away, he was 
he was not on the stage. My father wasn't on the stage. Mm. Sheikh Abdul Hadi was on the stage. Subhanallah. And he was on the, I think the, in the front row. I think somebody said to him like, "What are you doing? Mm. You should be you should be on stage." Like you, he was a general secretary. So you should be you the general secretary. You should be on the stage. Yeah. And uh, he was like, no. He goes, it's, you know, he goes. Other people should be on there. It's good for other people to, you know, be on the stage. It's, he's, uh, he's obviously thinking about yeah. the long term, and of course, you know, there's going to be a time when you know people you know, won't yeah. be around or they'll step down, and you need new faces, fresh faces on the stage. And Spinal Lights, uh, you know, it's amazing how, you know, how forward thinking he was. And even like I remember, I had a, a talk of my father's. And I'm not sure which year. I was in the 80s sometime, maybe yeah. 86, 85. I'm not sure. And Subhanallah, in the in the mid 80s, he's doing a talk. He's talking about how we need more lectures, more talks, more programs in the English language. Subhanallah. Because he's saying people, our children here, they're growing up speaking English. We need to be able to reach them, so we have to have more programs in the English language and literature. I'm not sure if you mentioned literature, but yeah. you were saying talks, lectures, you know, uh, programs in the English language. We have to have it for these, you know, for 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 for, for, for the Muslims here, and that's mm -hmm. in the 80s. And we know, you know, how uh, you know how long people were doing, um, you know, khutbas and talks in other languages, yeah. you know, fr from their local countries for so long. Yeah, you know, up until like even, uh, you know, up until like the the noughties, yeah. after the year 2000, it was still common to yeah, do yeah. khutbahs and talks in like you know other languages when people in the crowd have no idea what, <laughs> what what's being said or what they're talking about yeah. so I was, when i heard that, i was like wow that's you yeah. know it's, it's, it's impressive yeah Allah mm -hmm. back. yeah mashallah okay can we can we talk about uh and you don't have to you can if you don't want to about the in 1988 when he did pass away uh, Allah uh because i was um again with my research uh, there was an article in a British newspaper about it. About uh, they just reported a short uh, article about um, him passing away. Because I know even at the moment, like before he passed away, he was still, you know, invested and dedicated and driven. Because he was coming back from Scotland from meeting with uh, what's it called brothers who were from Al Hadith there to establish a a place there. Uh, and on the way back is when there was a car crash, and you were in the car. Yeah, I was in the car. Yeah, it was me, my uh, my father, my grandmother, my mum, my mum, and my brother, older brother. Older brother. Yeah, he was the middle one. Okay. Yeah, so my father, my grandmother, and my brother passed away. Subhanallah. Yeah. I think there was some issue with the the battery. The battery died, and it was in the middle of the motorway. So it was. Uh, and you hear you still around like four years old. Yeah, four years old. So 88 you, you don't remember it all. I don't remember anything No SubhanAllah That was, yeah, it was 88 um, Yeah SubhanAllah Yeah, yeah it's, it's, just, it's just You know The, the Qadr of Allah Yeah It just shows it's Allah's decree You don't know what's going to happen When it's going to happen yeah. But what you do know is how um, People are going to be remembered As a result of the actions What they did What they said um, That And this is a lesson I think for, for all of us you know, you don't know when it's going to come, when your when your end is going to come, when you're going to die. Um, but people are going to remember you as a result of what you did, Indeed. how you behaved, what you said, you know, your actions, your deeds. So yeah, that was uh, eighty eight. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously I have to give credit to my to my mother. You know, subhanAllah, to lose your father, your your uh, you sorry your husband, your your mother, mother and your son. Yeah. SubhanAllah, it's, uh, can't can't imagine how how difficult it must have been. Yeah. So you know, Allah preserve Allah her and Allah, Allah give her, you know, reward her for I mean. for the everything that she went through. Allah I mean, and I mean that that's a really important uh, point of benefit you gave Sheikh. You know, because obviously, you know, when when we do these podcasts, um, the main point, uh, the main thing that I we want the viewers to is to extract benefit from the conversations that we do have, and that is very true. You never know when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, but definitely it's about what what you did uh, for for you know. To whether it, it was for people or for the dawa, that's people going to be remembering you, remember you by. Yeah, and that's 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 all we had as well. And it's obviously very young, four years old. Yeah. So a lot of it is just people speaking about my father, saying things about my father, talking about my father. Yeah. You know, um, my father-in-law as well. Rahimahullah. Yeah. You know, he passed away during the COVID years a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, but he's from the same town as my father. Subhanallah. Yeah, and it was I was just like. 
coincidence kind of thing you know it wasn't yeah uh, expected or anything but yeah he would tell stories they knew each other from a young age they were like young uh, like uh, friends they would play play together and so and he you know he would talk about how when he would come um he would take his bags when he would come to visit from england yeah. or even from the jamia in medina but he would go back in the summers yeah. in pakistan uh, he would take his bags for him and my father would say what are you doing like you know because he's their <laughs> friends he's like no you don't take my bags he's like no 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 he goes you know you're studying in medina and this and that and yeah you know, so he would he, he would talk about that as well yeah so yeah it's just stories like that you know you hear people mention and talk about it yeah and then he becomes this it's legend you know yeah, yeah and you think wow this is amazing and that's how i heard about medina as well subhanallah you know, that was uh, be, be, before we get cuz i want to talk about your your decision to go to medina i mean to uh, to make people understand you know cuz legend is a great word to use you know i mean i was looking and um, when your father passed away there was letters that were sent to uh, to the markaz jamiat 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 sorry and uh, letters from sheikh uh, ibn baz you know, uh, Sheikh uh, Asif Rahman Al Mubarak Puri as well. You know, these like scholars who were, you know, sending in messages yeah. for for your father. You know, mm. so legend is a good word yeah. to use. Allah Mubarak. And there's something to be said about you know people who pass away when they're younger. Mm-hmm. When you when you remember them in uh, you know uh, um, in that light. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. they're young and they're active and you know, they have that. Nashalt, you know, they have that, they, 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 that zeal, zeal. They, 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 they're, they're active in that way. Yeah. You know, there's something to be said about that, I think. People yeah. who, it's like, they kind of, their legacy lives on. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's kind of different. It's not, obviously, there's always Baraka when you're blessed with more life and you're able to do more. Of course. But, you know, the Malcolm X, similar thing. Yeah, yeah. There's this thing about, you know, when people die young. Yeah, yeah. They're like uh, remembered, you yeah. know, immortalized in... Uh, in, in the things that they said and in the videos and interviews yeah and, yeah you understand yeah so yeah it's also one of those things that people when they pass away young they, they, how active they were they kind of remembered uh, uh, in, in their youth I yeah. think more yeah yeah because obviously they, they didn't they, they didn't reach old age yeah subhanallah so I think there's something to be said about that definitely I mean even the videos you know the conference uh, there, there's still videos of uh, of your father yeah. on, on YouTube yeah, yeah. you know that were posted from this masjid and yeah. even to add to that you know what you mean what you're talking about um, a legacy that was left behind was the masjid itself you know us being here being able to do the podcast talk about it and everything that happens here you know was from that vision that started everything and, and that's uh, that's yeah. definitely something amazing and now to move on to you, Sheikh, um, did your decision to go to Medina, right? Was it influenced by your father's legacy? Yeah. <laughs> Basically. No hesitation. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, mean, I didn't know anything about the university except that my father went there. Ajeeb. So, yeah, that was, I just heard about Jamia Islam. Yeah, well, Medina University, you know, I was, you know, you know Arabic, it's just Medina University, you know, Medina University. And your father went to Medina University and I was like, okay, four, five years old, six years old, seven years old. You know, people talking about Medina University. My father was in Medina University. Um, and just talking about, and obviously I'm thinking, okay, it's basically because of Medina University that he is who he is. And so, um, and then you'd hear about other people who had graduated from there um, who would come and they would give da'wah. Of course, like, you know, our elders, like uh, Sheikh Abdul Hadi and Sheikh Hafidullah. Yeah. Um, uh, Sheikh Shu'aib from Banbury, yeah. you know, Hafizahumullah, may Allah preserve them all. Amen. And then you get, you know, people who came maybe later on, obviously Abu Sama, yeah. you know, he used to come to the Green Masjid like back in the back in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. And so I must have been like, what, maybe eight, nine years old. Subhanallah. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sitting there and he's Abu Sama talking. I'm like, whoa, this guy's <laughs> sick, you know, American accent and everything. Obviously, in those days, there's no YouTube or anything. Yeah. This American guy coming, uh, Bilal Phillips. Oh, Bilal wow. Phillips as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I heard of Osama first, and then we like Abu Bilal Phillips. You know, he's a you know a black river from America or from Canada, but I think he was in America for a while. I'm not sure. Yeah. And we're like, yeah, I was I was eight nine years old. I was like, yeah, yeah, let's go and see him as well. I'm thinking of Abu Sama in my head. Yeah. That kind of character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we go and we uh, you know we, we sit down and. My bro- it's my brother, my older brother, mm-hmm. who's like, you know, I'm going with my older brother, and he's obviously he was he was on side like properly practicing, and yeah. you know, so you, when you're younger, you just go along with it. Yeah. And um, but Andra, we were, it wasn't like we were from a Western background or anything. Yeah, we, yeah. Were, we, we were okay. Yeah, um, so we went, and it was Bilal Phillips, and it was completely different. Yeah. And at the age of eight nine, 
you know, you're looking for like j- people, uh, you know, du'a to crack jokes and yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. more street. And Balafal is the opposite. Yeah, yeah. He's like technical and he's calm and, yeah. you know, his tone is different. And I was, wasn't, I was thinking, I was, I was disappointed. I was thinking, <laughs> this is, what's this, man? And you never, you don't, you, you never, I didn't appreciate it. Yeah. When you're older, it was uh, his book, Fundamentals of Tawheed. Yeah. I read that book and I was like, this is something else. Yeah. This, this, uh, no, before the Islamic studies, his, okay. his Islamic studies books. Okay. And I was thinking, Subhanallah, this, you know, this Sheikh is something else, man. Just yeah. the way he writes. Yeah, yeah. I was so, and then his talks as well. He's very methodical. You know, yeah. the way he breaks things down. I was very impressed. But yeah. I know, in those days when I was younger, I was thinking, you know, <laughs> I just, where's Abu Sama, man? Yeah. Like, where's the, you need the charisma. Yeah, yeah. Where's the charisma? Where's the? Not that he doesn't have charisma, but yeah, Abu Sama is a different character. Everyone's yeah. different. Yeah, definitely. Everyone's different in, in the way they give da'wah. Yeah. So yeah, but mostly it was it was from it was from my father. You know, Jamia Islamia, Medina University. And I used to think, yeah, I'm gonna go. You know, I'm gonna go to Medina because my father went. Yeah, wow. That's what it was initially. How did you end up applying? I applied twice. Once um, I just gave my papers. No, not the first time I went. Okay. Yeah, I went. Asin was there. Mashallah. Yeah, so Asin's my cousin. Ma. You know that, yeah. Yes, Asin. Yeah. So yeah, so Asin was there, um, and my brother had been there before. So he'd been back for I think a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't graduate. He went for a few years and he came back. Um, so I'd always heard, you know, people are going, coming. It's Birmingham, so you know, you know, people who are, have have been there. Uh, people, many people have dropped out. <laughs> yeah, they, don't, they don't finish, yeah. and then other people who you know who who are studying there at the moment, and uh, some of them would come back and they just complain about, you know, how messed up you know the, the place was <laughs> and how messed up Saudis were and how you know the Jamia is you know so hard and it's this and that. So you'd hear the stories, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't like I was thinking, ah, oh, sounds terrible, man. I, I ain't going now. I, so I was still like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go. Like, doesn't matter. I'm still gonna go. Um, so yeah, my brother. Uh, other brothers as well, uh, you know, who who had been there or they were there at, at the time. Uh, so by the time I uh, applied and I went there for Umrah, Ahsan was still there. Okay. And who else was there? Uh, I think nobody else that you you might be you you might know. Um, yeah, I think it was just Ahsan. Some of the brothers from who were local, like Birmingham. Yeah. Um, but obviously there was the fitna at the time as well. Of course. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't like you know. Uh, there were brothers there who who weren't like on the same kind of flex, if you like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I went to Aston was there, did the interview and everything. Uh, I didn't get in that year. Um, um, how old were you then? How old were you there? That was 2002, I think. So 18. MashaAllah. So 18, yeah, 18. Yeah. And then the following year I applied again. And I just gave my papers in. Sheikh Shuaib, who was the general secretary of the Markaz, um, uh, he gave my papers to Sheikh Abdul Muslim Al Qasim, the Imam of the Masjid yeah. in uh, Medina, and uh, Alhamdulillah I got in second second time. Subhanallah. Yeah. So then, two, 2004, I left. Amazing, you never gave up after that first try. Yeah, yeah, I was determined. Yeah, I was devastated to be honest, <laughs> <laughs> not getting in. But you know what it is? I think um, it's it's a it's a tricky one because. I never had any plan B That's the problem Subhanallah I didn't have a plan B Which is good But it's not good Yeah You need to have You know A plan B um, I went to college But I just went to college For the fun of it mm. I wasn't interested Yeah I was thinking I don't I don't want to do this You know But people were saying to me It's a good idea to You know But I was like No I don't I don't care Like I'm not It's not what I want to do And obviously you're a teenager as well Yeah You know and You know You want to make your own decisions And you're in that phase um, so I didn't really have a plan B and I was just thinking I want to go to Medina and I want to benefit people when I come back but you you just have to you, first of all you need guidance Yeah, you need somebody who's kind of uh, has a mentor position who's going to give you advice going to you know somebody you look up to somebody who will give you the right advice and tell you what you need to do and I didn't really I don't, I don't think people really had that yeah. um, at the time uh, you know just to tell you, look, this is it makes sense for you to like have a plan B, a plan C. But at the same time, that was what drove me to make sure that I actually 
got in. Got in. Yeah. Saying like I wasn't like thinking like, I thought, there's nothing else I want to do. This is what I want to do. So even if it means you're applying three or four, five times, I'm, I'm going to get in. It's a problem. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a plan B, which again, it's double double edged sword, really. Yeah, yeah. So y- you got in, alhamdulillah, So you're probably around 19 years old. Oh yeah. So by the time I got there, I was 20. 20 years old. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and that. Uh, batch of students yeah. was a blessed batch, mashallah. Allah Yeah, you know who else was in my Sheikh Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali from Sheffield. Yeah. Uh, Muhammad Tim. MashaAllah. And uh, Sheikh Naveed yes. from Nelson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, that year was, and there was like there were others as well. Um, uh, there was a brother who came with us. Yeah, I'm about to tell you this. There was a brother who came <laughs> with us. And so we went to the, we went and Adr, there's a brother called Abdul Rauf who got accepted in Riyadh, same year. Okay. Um, Sheikh Abdul Hadi's nephew. MashaAllah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So me and him went to the embassy. And that's a different story, man. Everyone's got their, you know, every university has <laughs> got their embassy story. <laughs> so we went to the embassy to get our papers sorted. And we met we meet a, 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 a brother, the elderly, elderly brother. And he said, yeah, I'm giving my papers in for my son. He's great. He's he's got he's he's got accepted. We were like, okay, mashallah. He said, yeah. He goes, you know, when you go there, just take care of him. So he's telling so you. Was, huh? He was telling this to you. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking. Okay, he said, take care of him. I was like, okay. So I didn't understand what he meant. Yeah. And uh, we could get all our paperwork sorted out. And that's another story because we 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 delayed. Yeah. It was the first year they had the criminal. Uh, you have to produce a criminal record, a record or something yeah, or yeah. That, you're, that you've got a clean slate. Clean slate, yeah. And no one, no one knew what it was. Subhanallah. So we'd, we'd call people, we'd call you know the uh, the embassies or whoever it was that you're supposed to call. I don't know. Mohammed Tim was was good at that stuff. He would try to sort it out and try to call here and there. And everyone was like, "Look, it's nothing to do with us. Like, if you want to go somewhere, you can go. If you want to study somewhere, you can go and study. We don't have like a." something like a, an official government document to state that literally what they wanted was something to say look he's not a criminal he's, he hasn't he doesn't have a criminal record okay. but they said we don't do anything like that <laughs> now obviously it's, everyone knows what it is but back then it was the first time no one had any idea what, what, what they wanted um so yeah we, we went i think in the uh, end of october or beginning of november we were very late yeah so we we're running around going to the embassy trying to figure out this it was because of this and eventually they didn't do it. They just said, "Okay, just fine, just come," because it was, you know, no one knew what was, no one knew what it was, how to get it, how to acquire it. Yeah. Um, so we we go to Medina, and this brother, uh, whose father was in the embassy that we met, uh, you know, we get we are talking and stuff, and uh, basically he he didn't know he was he he didn't know uh, that he was applying. His father applied for him. Oh subhanallah! So he didn't, and he didn't want to go. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, he didn't want to go. He wasn't interested. Okay. In coming to Medina, yeah. didn't want to go to Medina. Wasn't yeah. interested. His father did it like behind his back. <laughs> gave all the paperwork in. Okay, he got accepted. And then I think, as a month or so, before he was to fly out, he told him. <laughs> yeah. He's and from UK. From UK. Yeah, yeah. From London. Yeah. And he wasn't interested. Thank Just you. wasn't interested. Like, wasn't coming to lessons, you know, to the extent where even I was thinking, this guy, man, like, it's a chance of a lifetime. Yeah. You know, he's just not, you know, coming late, you know, he'd come and drag himself into into class, he's half asleep, <laughs> sleeping on the desk, and just like, you know, getting, the teachers are getting annoyed with him. He's getting, he's getting annoyed with the teachers. <laughs> he's just completely not interested. And we're all like, you know what, next year, he, there's no way he's coming back next year. Yeah. He's just not interested. Uh, come next year, he comes back, Subhanallah. and we're like, what you, "Why? <laughs> what are you back for? What, what, what are you doing here?" And uh, you know, again, similar, just not really interested. You know, you can tell it's maybe family issues, fathers telling him to come, whatever. Uh, but he, you know, he's probably thinking, "Might as well just make a bit of an effort and might as well study while I'm here." Yeah. Anyway, he, I think he's just finished his doctorate now. Allah Akbar. He's just finished his doctorate. He's, he's just finished his doctorate. Ajeeb. Subhanallah. Just finished his doctorate now. I haven't spoken to him for a while. I think this year or last year he finished. I mean, you know, you don't you don't know who is going to excel. 
sometimes you think, yeah, mashallah, this student's going to do really well. You know, it's promising. And they drop out after a year. SubhanAllah. And then you get others, you think, no way. No way he's going to last. Yeah. And they t- you know, he did his doctorate, mashallah. SubhanAllah. So, I think that's um, <clears throat> a very big lesson to take as well, you know, from brothers who are going and want to go, you know. Now, if, if people go, I always tell them, why do you want to go? Mm-hmm. What's, your, what's the purpose? And, you know, obviously they're going to say, I want to come back and give da'wah. Yeah. I want to benefit people. But I don't know. I think you need more than that these, these days. Mm. You need more. There has to be, you have to have a goal in mind, a vision. Yeah, yeah. You know, like there has to be a, a more uh, laid out plan about what it is you want to do, uh, what are your goals, uh, what are your objectives. Um, yeah, it's because it's very easy. And of course, I had the same thing. It was my father ultimately, but of course you see other people graduating, yeah. And you think, yeah, man, like you know, these guys are like, you know, giving talks and khutbas and, you know, yeah. uh, saying all the Arabic uh, terminology and you think, yes, you know, <laughs> and so you start thinking, I want to go to Medina, and so sometimes it might be, you know, those intentions might not be, uh, you know, well thought out, yeah. You know, you're, you're going because you see other people going yeah. and they come back as scholars and you're like, yeah, that's what I want. I want to go and become a scholar. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing, scholars say there's nothing wrong with a person having that intention as long as he's doing it for the sake of Allah. Of course. He wants to be an alim and, you know, teach people. That's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that. Mm. Um, but I think it's it's kind of, a, it can be uh, misplaced because the Jamia isn't what people think. Yeah, it's not what people think in terms of. Look, if if I said to somebody, okay, go and live in, uh, go and live in Cardiff. You've never been to Cardiff, okay, or go and live in uh, London, or go and live in, uh, I don't know, Cornwall, or you know, uh, Edinburgh or somewhere, somewhere you've never been before. Go and live there, uh, you know, for a year. It's not going to be easy. Yeah, you don't know anybody there. Yeah, the cu- the culture might be slightly different. People yeah. are different. Yeah, place is different. You know. Uh, Places that you're going to eat or places you're going to, you know, frequent. It's not going to be what you're used to. Yeah. It's going to be hard, and that's in England or in the UK. Yeah, yeah. let alone so, in a different country. Yeah, so forget about you know the Islamic aspect of it. Yeah. Just practically, yeah. you know, uh, getting up and you know, uh, moving and going to a place where it's a different, it's a different world essentially. It's like a different place. You know, it's a different environment, different language, different people, different weather. Know, the weather's different. The food is different. The culture's different. Yeah. You know, uh, the bureaucracy is different. The, the, the paperwork and the, you know how long the things take, and it gets very tedious, especially for us. Yeah. It's not the same. So yeah. all, take all that into account, and then the living conditions—they're mm. not the same. Yeah. It's uh, subhanallah. It's, it's not easy when you're living when you're there. Yeah, because a lot of students they move out, especially like Western students. Mm. They they would just move out. Subhanallah. Yeah, they'd like stay there for a few years, and then they would move out. I was in Jamia for seven years in Allah the, in the Allah. university itself. Oh. Which uh, be, obviously you get, you become you know institutionalized. You get used to how things are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, initially we had like a room with six six students Mashallah. in the room. Yeah, and, and just curtains. Subhanallah. Yeah, because we had a, a new dorm that was built for us, but because we came late, we were in the oldest uh, one of the oldest dormitories. Subhanallah. Because that we became late, so we weren't able to. Yeah. Um, but alhamdulillah, I I already expected it. Mashallah. Because every. Everyone would talk about it, you know, because we're in Birmingham, you know, there's people who either graduated or, or, or lots of dropouts as well. So they'd all talk about, you know, how how the conditions are and my brother was there as well and, you know, his friends and they would always talk about how messed up it was. And So I already had, I already knew. Yeah, you meant to be part Yeah, yeah, I knew exactly what, well, how it was going to be and I was thinking, okay, you know, uh, I'm expecting it. But I remember other students, they would, they would see the conditions, they'd be like, what's this? They, they, they don't know. What, what to do They don't know what to say They, they don't know what to think Because they're expecting Something in their mind Yeah you know, Jam Islami uh, Islamic University of Medina Thinking it's going to be Like five star You know really, like, yeah, yeah like Oxford University Oxford, or something, yeah. <laughs> okay, which... And they go there And it's like Conditions are terrible And <laughs> so they, they just They don't know what to do They're like You know they, they can't believe it You know But you have that expectation And if you have the expectation Then you can manage it yeah. And then you know How it's going to be And then you can just it's still hard of Obviously course. it's not easy Yeah But you kind of You can live with it Jazakallah khair And Sheikh um, <coughs> with, You know a lot A lot can be said about um, You can have like a separate podcast Just on You know your experiences in Medina 
you know, um, I wanted to link it, you know, to, of course, your father who had been there, you know, Rahimahullah. Um, now I want to ask you about, <coughs> if you can, you know, there was probably so many lessons you've learned from being in Medina, but maybe a lesson that you took away from your experiences in studying in Medina that you will never forget till this moment right now. You can always look back at that moment and says that was one of the biggest lessons for me. Yeah, it's hard to, I think, um, choose one specific thing. Yeah, just to pinpoint. Because, um, you know, sometimes you forget something yeah. and then something happens. Yeah. Or, or you go through an experience and then you're reminded of what happened that, in Medina. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's different lessons that you learn. It could be just life lessons. Yeah. You know, it could be like um, uh, experiences you had. You know, it could be things you learned from your teachers. Yeah. Um, it could be uh, things you observed. Um, I tell you, one of the things that I learned was um, how vast the Islamic Ummah was um, when you get there. Because it's a global village. Mm -hmm. Literally, I had a room. And in my room, I had uh, a French brother, Indonesian brother, and Sri Lankan brother. MashaAllah. And, you know, when you're, when you're in, in uh, England or Birmingham, wherever you are, you have a very, sometimes you have a very fixed idea of what Islam is. Yeah. You know, and how a Muslim should be, yeah. Um, because you're following, you know, you know, the, the the exact footsteps of your teacher, you know, and he's following the footsteps of his teacher, and you're in a you're in a bubble basically. Yeah. You know, even in terms of knowledge and understanding, especially when it comes to fiqh, mm. you know, uh, the different schools of fiqh and understanding, you know, the the ahkam of of salah and wudu, etc. And so sometimes you look down on people who might pray slightly differently. Mm. Um, this is very, you're living, it's very narrow-minded, living in a bubble. Yeah. When you go there, subhanAllah, you realize there are people there, okay, and they're clean-shaven. And you start thinking, it's messed up. <laughs> and then you realize, and then you realize they're forced to shave when they go back to their countries because if they don't shave when they get to their countries they're going to be in prison subhanallah and you think subhanallah like you know husnul dhan yeah is an important thing having good thoughts of your brother yeah but just understanding and realizing look you know your circumstances and how you live and you know how things are in your country or in your city is not like how other people are living in other parts of the world everyone has their own challenges everyone has their own issues and their own you know trials and tribulations they're going through you know the 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 you know the good things there that they you know that they that they have in those countries the bad things you know we have certain fit and fit in here that maybe they don't have in other countries yeah um so subhanallah just talking to people you know from different parts of the world you really understand and you really start to realize you know this it's not as black and white as we think yeah. you know there's many great areas about you know what people are going through and the hardships and the challenges and whether it's political or whether it's just uh, whatever the case may be, it's just it's not it's not easy. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's not easy to just. Um, uh, well, it's easy to assume. Yeah, you know that people are like you know just misguided or they don't know. I'm on the I'm on the I'm on the right path. Everyone else is misguided. But just understanding the different uh, you know circumstances that people are, are, are you know are growing up in and the different challenges. So yeah. that's that's one thing I learned. Um, Allah. In terms of in the lesson, obviously we're learning hadith and we're learning, you know, fiqh and the different subjects. But you know, like they would say, you learn from the, the, your teachers, adab and akhlaq, his manners before you learn yeah. what he's actually teaching. Yeah. And that, I've, I've, the, the, that's been the case so many times. Like I, I remember, and I still some of those. One things that I, one of the things that I would do is I would look and see how a, te a, a teacher would teach, and I did that even when I was in school. Mm -hmm. And I would look and I would observe, and if people were learning and they were like they were paying attention, I'd be like, yeah, he's doing something right here. Mm -hmm. And if people were messing around yeah. and they weren't listening or they weren't paying attention, they weren't learning, I didn't, they didn't really find the teacher, the teacher to be very good. I think why, like, why is he not? What's the difference? Yeah, what's going on? Or what, what is it about him that you know isn't really, you know, stimulating people to actually learn? Mm -hmm. So I would always do that. And in Medina, Subhanallah, like. You'd pick up, you'd pick up things. You'd get teachers who maybe knew things, but they weren't. They didn't know. They weren't. They didn't know how to teach. Hmm. We had a teacher who would just come in and he would just read from the mudakira, from the from the from his uh, note, note from his notes. Just sit, 
soon as he would sit down, he would just read, look down and read for like 50 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And Allah, I'm like, I don't know if he had, uh, you know, mental issues or something, uh, but he would just go off on the on students sometimes, just start, start shouting at them. Subhanallah. Yeah, it was like, and, you know, obviously I, w- I would realize this is, I w- I'm, this is how not to teach. This is what you shouldn't be doing because it's not, no one's paying attention. No one's listening. Um, we had another teacher, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Sultan. A lot of these teachers as well, they're not well known. Yeah. You know, no one knows who they are. But as for as teachers, they were just subhanAllah, some of the best teachers I ever had. This teacher, you know, excellent akhlaq, friendly, smiling. And he would just come into the class and sometimes he would stand around, he would stand and walk around, or he would just lean on the table and he would just ask questions. And he would pause, he wouldn't answer, he would wait for us to, to answer. For example, he, I remember once he came in and he said, uh, Hal Jannah mawjud an? Is Jannah, does Jannah exist right now? And he would just stop. And students would be like, yes. And somebody would be like, and then he wouldn't say anything. He would just pause and look at us. <laughs> and then people would second guess. <laughs> and they were like, no. <laughs> and then, and sometimes we'd get into debate with each other. They'd be like, no, it does exist. And, be, and then, and he's just watching. Mm-hmm. But it was, the way he did it was, it was a, it was a masterclass, mashallah. Yeah. Because he's, ooh, he's making us now think. Yeah, yeah. He's making us think about the question. He's making us use our own, you know, brains, and it was amazing. I'd watch and I'd be like, "He do he do it? You no, he do he do it regularly." Mashallah. I was looking, I'd be like, that's, "That's really good, mashallah. That's amazing the way he would do it. Very impressive." Mashallah. And I, I still do because I, I teach. I still do it in school. Mashallah. Yeah, I do. I do the same thing. So I'll ask a question, and the same thing. You just sit back, just sit, you know, stand quietly, ask the question, and some people would say no, some people would say yes. And because obviously, Jenna does exist. Mm-hmm. Just so that people know, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because Allah says, yeah, "Prepared yeah. for the, the believers." So it's something which does exist right now. But just that technique was really good. And then he then he would give the answer, and everyone's listening. Yeah, because yeah. they're like in two minds, or they're not sure, or they were sure, but then he didn't say anything, and so then they're second guessing. So that was amazing. We had another teacher called Hamud Sahli, yeah. and he taught us Kitab al Nikah. Mashallah, and. Uh, this this teacher, he and he he taught other people as well. He taught Ahsan as well, and Ahsan said the same thing. Yeah, he had stories, man, <laughs> about his own life. Oh, mashallah! So he would just talk about things that had happened. Sometimes it had nothing to do with the lesson, <laughs> but we'd come in and I would go in as well. I'd be like, I want to listen to what he's gonna say. Yeah, because he would just tell stories. Sometimes it'd be like random stories. Yeah, you know, you know those teachers who just just talk about all sorts. Yeah, yeah. and he but he taught as well. He was he was a good teacher. And Kitab al he was talking about how he, uh, you know, proposed, you know, how he, you know, uh, got, you know uh, got to know his father-in-law and yeah. the whole story. And mashallah, it was very, it was very nice. He's really, it was, it, that was the thing about him. He, you know, he was good at telling stories. Mashallah. You know, and you try to take that as well and, you know, use it as well when you're in your teaching. Yeah, yeah. Because everyone loves stories and it's a good break if you're teaching something like fiqh or whatever, hadith. You know, it's always good to kind of throw stories in there, you know, get people to relax a little bit and to kind of switch off and just listen to a story. And, mm-hmm. and he, he he would do that. It was just beautiful. That's so cool. yeah, every teacher was different. Of course. But, so you'd pick up things. Um, one thing also that I remember that I've been actually mentioning, I've mentioned it in a few lessons I've had and in school I mentioned it for assembly as well. Yeah. Um, on this, just, just, just this Wednesday. Uh, when I was in the Haram, I just saw the video today because it was recorded. I was in the Haram in Medina uh, and it was Maghrib time so the Adhan went and Sheikh Ali Hudayfi came out to lead the Salah Mashallah. and so you know he tells everyone to straighten their robes he's got this deep deep voice yeah. uh, so he makes takbir Allahu Akbar and there, you know starts the Salah and uh, Salah is Maghrib so we're waiting for Fatiha and I mean I mean like maybe the 10th row or something from the front. And uh, waiting for Fatiha, but Fatiha doesn't come. And instead he just says, in tadru daqiqa, wait a minute. You know this story? No, I don't. So um, <coughs> I'm thinking, what's going on? Other people are looking around. And some people miss Masakin, they don't know like, what's going on. They just carry on as right. if they're still praying. I'm thinking, was that like, what's going on? And then he says it again. Wait a minute. So I put my hands down, thinking, 
this isn't Fatiha. Like, I know Fatiha, <laughs> this isn't Fatiha. And uh, it just, everyone's just waiting. And a few minutes go by, four or five minutes go by. And uh, then again, you hear him straighten your rows, yeah. starts the salah, reads Fatiha, out of breath. Yeah, it seems like he's out of breath. So obviously we're thinking maybe something happened. Was he not well? He's yeah. old. He's yeah, still he alive. Still yeah. the Imam, um, longest serving Imam I think in, in Medina. And we're thinking, what's you know what, what happened? Was he ill or did something happen? Was it a health issue? And it was recorded because they record the, the the prayers. And so you see, the, I saw the video later. He starts the salah, and then after a while he raises his hands again, and takes a step back. And then he says, "In Tadru he takes his cloak off. Puts it down, and again he says in Tadru Wait a minute, and he goes off. A few minutes, comes back and starts the salah again. We realize basically he didn't have wudu. Mm. <laughs> he didn't have wudu, so he left the salah. Didn't care about what anyone thought. Wasn't interested in like you know oh, what are people gonna say? It's just so embarrassing. Oh my god, like I can't leave the salah. Everyone's gonna know I didn't have wudu. I broke my salah. You know, just went telling everyone like, just wait. I'll, I'm coming back. Just goes off. It's like I don't know how many people. It's the haram so like. I don't know, six, seven, eight, ten thousand people. Yeah. And so he just goes off, does wudu, you know. So everyone's I don't care. You guys just wait. I'm gonna go to wudu. You guys just wait, and uh, you know I need to do wudu basically. So yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna go and do wudu. So when I did wudu, came back and started the salah. Subhanallah. It's um, it's, subhanallah, unbelievable. Yeah. Like we all know, if you break your wudu. You go and you perform, you perform wudu again. The salah is not valid. Yeah. But to do it in salah, yeah, yeah. with people watching, yeah, yeah. it's not the same thing. Of course, it's supposed to be done. Yeah, we know yeah. we're supposed to do it. Yeah. But to actually do it, you know, in that circumstance, yeah, it just it, you know it just shows you know mashallah his level of you know taqwa and wara and his his you know his iman inshallah. Yeah, yeah. But that was that was that was impressive. We find out later, and I was like, yeah, man. Next level, mashallah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's really cool to do that in front of everybody. Yeah, you know, takes uh, takes takes guts. Yeah, definitely. Because any other person would just be thinking, oh, everyone's watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. Or you know, I'll just repeat the salah afterwards. Yeah, I'm not gonna leave the salah now. I'll just style it out and then after salah, I'll just go and you know, yeah, do yeah. it again and pray. You pray. The, the fact that he did that, mashallah, was yeah. So I remember that, and I mentioned to the kids as well, just about. Not caring about what other people think. Yeah, it's not about other people. It's about your yeah. relationship with Allah. Yeah, you know, yeah, your connection with Allah Azza wa Yeah. So yeah, I remember that. That was that. Uh, that's a story I remember. Yeah, There's exactly. loads of things that you just you know stories come and go. Sometimes experiences come and go, and you remember things, people you met, things that happened. You know. Yeah. And Sheikh, um, <clears throat> obviously, me and you we could sit here for. Hours on end and, and, and going through it, Allah Mubarak. But just to just to make a conclusion, inshallah, for those who are watching, um, any final advice for, I think for two people because we cover two things. Um, first is losing um, a close family relative first and foremost, and then secondly for those who want to go and pursue knowledge. So you know, for those who lose family members, especially like one's parents, yeah, uh, I think. Uh, it's good to remember that uh, we're in good company because the Prophet Sallallahu himself was yes. an orphan. Yeah. You know, he lost his father before he was born. He lost his mother when he was around the age of four. Um, and I think one of the lessons you learn or a lesson that one should learn is that uh, Allah always has a plan. Allah always has a plan. If my father was still alive, maybe I wouldn't have gone to Medina. SubhanAllah. You know, yeah. uh, you do get cases where uh, sometimes, you know, children of scholars don't end up being scholars or even people who are students of knowledge. Yeah. Just they just lead a simple life. Yeah. You know, they don't pursue that that path. Yeah. Uh, maybe because they're around it so much. Yeah. Maybe they just, you know, lose. I don't know, lose interest or whatever the case. Maybe they're just not. They don't have that interest anymore. They want to do something else. It's just maybe. It's too much because it's always around them. Allah knows best. Yeah. Um, so maybe it wouldn't have. I wouldn't have even gone. Uh, but you know, Allah says, "Well, we did the kabbal and fahada." You know, we found you lost and we guided you. Yeah. Talking about the Prophet So sometimes, you know, you realize 
that is not your uh, parents or your your guardians who are uh, protecting you and guiding you. It's ultimately Allah. And so one of the things you learn is Allah is the one who's guiding you. Allah is, doesn't matter if your parents have passed away. You know the Prophet Sallam was an orphan, yeah. the greatest man who ever lived. Yeah. And his parents weren't even alive to take care of him, to raise him, and to give him whatever he wanted. Allah is saying, "We were the ones who guided you when you were lost." You know, we were the one who, who and we we were the ones who enriched you. you know, I was the one who enriched you. So I think that's one lesson that we can learn. You know, yeah. uh, Allah is the one who's taking care of you. Allah will take care of you. You know, you take care of you know your your duties to Allah. Allah will, Allah will take care of the rest. Even if you know you're by yourself, mm. um, no one would have imagined the Prophet Sallam being who he was. You imagine somebody whose father's father father passes away before they're born. Mother passes away when they're four years old. You know, the grandfather who's the next guardian passes away when he's six. Somebody like this today, yeah, you would say he's, uh, you know, he's gonna struggle. Yeah, you know, he's not gonna amount to anything. Yeah, he's gonna be, you know, going to orphanages and uh, mm. you know he might end up in in, in juvenile in juvenile or whatever it is. Yeah. He might end up leading life of crime. It wouldn't be a surprise. Yeah, like, yeah, it's expected. Yeah. That kind of upbringing. And the fact that that was the case with the Prophet وسلم, and then he became who he became, Allah is telling us, you know, I was the one who took care of you. And so that's, I think, one of the lessons we can learn. All is not lost. We're yeah. in good company. No. Jazakallah khair. And for those who uh, want to, to go and study, uh, whether it be in Medina or in Riyadh, or what kind of um, advice can we give to them? Can you give to them? Um, obviously, I think first and foremost, you know, just sincerity. Mm. That's the main thing. That's what's going to drive you. I really think we always hear it about sincerity, and you know, sincerity is the first thing people mention. It's like, okay, okay, yeah, sincerity. But what's after <laughs> what, sincerity? Exactly. You know, what's the next thing? But Subhanallah, if you're not sincere, let's say for example, you went to the, the Jamia because you wanted to be famous. Okay. If you're not sincere, you're going to get to the jam. You're going to think, you know what? This isn't worth it. There's other ways of me being famous. Okay, I'll just uh, stay a year or two, and then I'll go back and I'll, you know, pretend, pretend, pretend as if you know I've studied for like five or six years, or you know, or I'll just the the drive won't be there then. Yeah, because there's no long term goal, which is you know, good deeds and pleasing Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, having your scale of good deeds, uh, you know, heavy on the day of judgment. Those goals aren't there. The objective isn't like so high, yeah. and so you're not gonna. There's no motivation there. So sincerity is like key. Also, to have you know a backup plan, you gotta have a backup plan. I think. Mm. Uh, you know, as Muslims, we're, we're told to prepare. Mm. You know, وَأَعِدُ لَهُمْ مَا سَتَعْطُ مِنْ قُوَّةِ Allah says, prepare as much as you can with strength. When Allah was talking about the, you know, uh, preparing to to fight the disbelievers in time of the Prophet yeah. Sallam, as Muslims, we're told to you know be ready and prepare. You know, and make preparations. You know, always have a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Yeah. You know, always have backup plans. You know, it's it's part of it's part of our deen. You know, to you know to to prepare. So we shouldn't just throw our eggs in one basket. Wherever mm. we're going, if it's Egypt, if it's Riyadh, if it's Medina, wherever a person plans on going, you know, I think uh, always have a plan, uh, a long term plan. Okay, a backup plans before he goes, but also a long term plan about what he's going to do when he comes back. I think mm. the, I think the problem many of us have, especially in Medina. I can only spoke to speak about Medina is when we come back, we don't really know what exactly we're going to do. We want to give da'wah, but you know. How are we going to do it? To what extent are we going to do it? Uh, in what capacity are we going to do it? Uh, you know, on top of the fact that we're going to have families and we're going to be married and you're going to have children and you have to work, you know, all those things. You need to have a plan about how you're going to, you know, uh, execute that well while at the same time, you know, having a kind of living. And of course, the scholars of the past they would have provi- they would have professions. Yeah, you know, uh, Imam Hanif rahimahullah was a cloth merchant, and he was he, he was a uh, Tajir, a businessman. Sheikh Albani was a watch. Uh, he would repair watches. Yeah. So it's good to have some some skills just so that you can fall back on it. And if you need to like in a living, then you you have something. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Just sincerity, having having a plan, and uh, being uh, being driven. Mm. I think you have to be. Uh, you have to make sure that you, you know you stick with it. Yeah. Just regardless of what happens. Like for me, it was just a case of. There's nothing that's going to stop me from, there's nothing that's going to make me 
leave and quit until yeah. I finish. Yeah, because I I I wanted it for so long. Yeah, yeah. You understand? So so much time had gone by. I was finally there. I was like, okay, well, I need to finish. Yeah. You know, if I finish late, if uh, whatever happens, I I'm gonna stay. There's no question about it. Zakallah khair. Well, I think it's um it's been so beneficial, man. And um, I think uh, I'm hoping, inshallah, this is the first of many times you'll inshallah. be joining us, inshallah. As you see, it's it's uh it's not that bad. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. Yeah, first time doing a podcast, so uh, yeah. You're, you're experienced in this, mashallah. No, no, My first time. Uh, but it was nice, alhamdulillah. Uh, no, uh, Allah, Allah reward you all. And, uh, Ameen. May Allah make this a beneficial, uh, beneficial thing, inshallah. Allahumma ameen. Inshallah, we've, um, we've got plans to kind of um, continue uh, talking about um, the legacy of, of the Greenland Masjid, inshallah, and have the elders involved. Of course, um, uh, our Imam, inshallah, who's Khalid uh, Zakhal, is going to be doing some of those episodes, bin Allah ta'ala. Inshallah, that's, that's but really this good. was kind of like the the step towards that yeah yeah which was uh it was uh, very very insightful you know and uh, your stories from medina and your experiences is something that i think the the, the people who are listening can take away sure. a lot of benefit from so just like allah khair uh, ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve you and i thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to be here and discussing this uh inshallah for that we'll conclude inshallah uh to the viewers uh, if you found this beneficial make sure to like subscribe Comment below and we'll be back inshallah with new episodes for this year. Uh, Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shadu la ilaha 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 il